I believe in the core of my being that there is nothing that is a stronger catalyst for passionate, holy living, wanting to get out there and to share your faith than a, than a proper understanding of the end times and the day in which we are living. And digging into eschatology, digging into a study of the last days can be such a catalyst to, to give us that, that motivation, that excitement, that enthusiasm to know the times in which we are living. And you should know that there are hundreds of millions of people that are five times a day turning and praying to this pagan idolatrous system. And it is absolutely tragic. Here you see a larger crowd, <clears throat> again, circumambulating uh, during the Hajj, but people come all, th all through the year, not just once a year. Um, people can come, it's called the Umrah. They come different times of the year to worship there. Now, I want you to see, this is where we're going to get into, and it's very important. We're going to get into see, <clears throat> not only is this a religious center, but it is being turned into an unbelievable economic powerhouse, the likes of which the world may have never seen before. You see the cranes that are going on? They are completely transforming Mecca in the middle of the desert. You see the Kaaba in the center. They are creating platforms so that many, many more millions of people can come. And, they're, and the Saudi government, by the way, is getting rich off of all the pilgrims coming. That's important for later in the discussion. So you can see all the cranes that they're doing. They have essentially, watch this, they have essentially, here is the Kaaba in the center, bulldozed most of central Mecca to make way for the fourth tallest tower on planet Earth, which is a clock tower dedicated to Allah with a moon observatory at the top and the lunar or the crescent moon, of course, you can see at the top, the largest clock tower on planet Earth, fourth, I believe, largest, tallest building in the world. It's made up of seven towers. Of course, the clock tower in the center is the largest of the seven towers. By square footage, it is the largest building on planet Earth. The largest building on planet Earth. Now you can see they are completely transforming the whole center around the Kaaba. And what they are doing out in these locations here, they are building skyscrapers, towers, for very, very, very wealthy Muslims around the world to buy a piece of Mecca to come. Just to give you a framework of how large that structure is, here's a different view of it. By the way, the, the, the main tower is a Four Seasons Hotel. There is a Hilton Hotel and about six, four or five other major hotel chains that are there. And inside of this largest building on planet Earth are 4,000 shops. 4,000 shops as part of the complex. The monarchy of Saudi Arabia is planning on completely transforming Mecca. And they are using the religious system of Islam to build something economically that has never been seen before. It is absolutely astounding what is going on in Mecca. Now, I want to point out to you that Mecca, you can see, is an inland city. And for those of you who are thinkers, and you read the description in Revelation 17 and 18, there's a seaport that's involved in all of this. And how is it possible that Mecca could fit the description when there's a seaport? I can smell the wood burning out there. I know you're thinking it. Mecca is about 40 miles from the Red Sea. And for those of you who've never been to the Red Sea, let me tell you. It is a beautiful body of water. I have been there not at Saudi Arabia, but in Israel and in Jordan, um, a tributary that comes up the Gulf of Aqaba. And it's a beautiful body of water with amazing scuba, crystal blue clear waters. And when you see the desert sloping into the sea, it is truly a spectacular place to visit. This is 40 miles from the city of Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. By the way, here's, the other, here's a close-up of the tower, uh, the seven towers that make up. It's called the Mecca Royal Clock Tower, incidentally. Okay, 
Now here's what I want to point out to you. Mecca is located approximately here, about 40 miles from Jeddah. <coughs> Jeddah is the largest port city next to Mecca, closest one. You can drive between the two in about an hour. Also, you have Medina up here, and I'll get to this location up here, K-A-E-C, I'll get to that in just a moment. The capital city of Riyadh is right here. Let me start with Riyadh just for a minute to get into the economics briefly. And please don't glaze over because it's so important to understand how this all dovetails together. I know it's a lot of information. In Riyadh, the capital city, this is what is happening right now. They are building, it's called the King Abdullah Financial Center. Now, normally you build one skyscraper at a time. But when you are transitioning from a petroleum-based trillion-dollar empire concerned that oil will not last forever, as the Saudi Arabian government is concerned, to an economy that is built on other, other things, industry, business, and shipping, which I will get to just momentarily. So this is going on. Also, just south of, just south of Riyadh, they are planning a city the size of Las Vegas. And, you know, when the Saudi Arabians, with the money that they have and the resources they have, trillions. By the way, they're getting ready to sell off por portions of their oil empire called Aramco. It used to be known as the Arab American Oil Company. They're looking to sell 5% of that. The company itself is valued at over two trillion dollars. The, the most valuable business on planet Earth. They're just selling a portion of it and they're going to be able to fund anything their hearts desire. If I, if I could, if I had the time to tell you about all the excesses of the monarchy in the Saudi Arabians, you would just be shocked. Gold-plated cars, billion-dollar mansions, uh, all over the world. Every excess you can imagine, and many of them vile excesses too. But just south of Riyadh, they're building a city like Las Vegas. The new, and this is what's shocking, the new head of Saudi Arabia, King Solomon, he's a younger uh, Saudi monarch, he has said, I want to build like a Las Vegas style city just south of the capital city because a lot of young Saudi Arabians have a very low median age, by the way, and a lot of Saudi Arabians, they want to go other places and do other things. He wants to have all the entertainment for them right there in the center of Saudi Arabia for them to enjoy just south of the capital city. As a matter of fact, they're building a Six Flags that's going to cost three quarters of a billion dollars <laughs> just to the south of Riyadh. It's in the plans. Now, over here to Jeddah. Not to be outdone, you know, Mecca has the fourth tallest skyscraper in the world. By the way, over here, which technically is part of the Arabian Peninsula, is Dubai. Have you heard of Dubai? And the booming Dubai, you know, the biggest, the tallest building in the world is the Burj Dubai, the tower that sits right over in here. That's all part of the Arabian Peninsula. We have different borders today, but it's all part of the Arabian Peninsula, biblically. Tallest building in the world is over here. Fourth tallest building just, just constructed in Mecca in the last few years, the Royal Clock Tower. Not to be outdone, the port city of Mecca, which is Jeddah, only 40 miles away, they are in the process of building the tallest skyscraper on planet Earth, close to twice as high as the Mecca Clock Tower <laughs> that, you, that you just saw. That's in Jeddah. They are totally transforming Jeddah, Saudi Arabia because of the significance of its port. However, what I really want to call your attention to, this is in Riyadh, this is also in Riyadh, what they're building there, the financial center. What I really want to call your attention to, again, this is Arabia. You have the coast right in here. You have Mecca in this location uh, right in here, and then you have Jeddah. Right up in this location right here is a brand new port city that's being built called the King Abdullah Economic city. King Abdullah Economic City. It's the king that has passed away. He started this, this new city that he wanted to construct. He wanted it to be based upon shipping. Shipping is the new means of finance for Saudi Arabia. So right in here, and I'll just show you a picture of the, of the architectural design for this city, King Abdullah Economic City. Pretty shocking, isn't it? And they have the money to build it. And they're already working on it. Golf courses, institutions, universities are all being constructed 
in that location. But the major emphasis is shipping. I want to read this to you. With its strategic location and state-of-the-art technologies, all managed by national and global experts who strive to offer the best possible services, King Abdullah Port has earned its place at the heart of the world's major shipping lines, all within a solid plan that will bring to reality its vision of becoming one of the largest ports in the world. There are plenty of aspects that set King Abdullah Port apart from others in the region, on top of which is its strategic location, says Abdullah, and I won't try to pronounce his name, the head of the Ports Development Company. Listen to this. Some 20 to 25 of the world's non-petroleum trade passes through the Red Sea, which translates into about 730 million tons of freight on more than 11,000 vessels having passed through the Suez Canal in 2015. And of course, the Suez Canal is at the north end of the Red Sea through Egypt and out to the Mediterranean Sea. 11,000 vessels in 2015. Is it coming into focus now as we read the book of Revelation? Let's go on. Given these astounding figures, King Abdullah's port, port strategic location in the Red Sea is bound to make it the premier gateway for goods into Saudi Arabia and the emerging markets of neighboring countries and a hub for the transshipment industry in Middle Eastern ports and beyond. Did you get the wording? It is bound to make it the premier gateway for goods into Saudi Arabia. And in Revelation 17 and 18, what are the merchants when they see the smoke of her burning and they see the devastation they're in their ships far off, looking at the smoke of her burning, and they are wailing, and they say, who is going to buy our stuff anymore? Amen. It's an absolute parallel. This is part of that city, and this is called Financial Island. This is Saudi Arabia's concept of what they plan to do to bring the world's banking system to King Abdullah, economic city, on the Red Sea, perfectly positioned as a major port next to the city of Jeddah and the religious center of Mecca in Saudi Arabia. Now, I'm going to just go back briefly to show you something. If you see Mecca, Jeddah, and King Abdullah economic center, they're building one of the world's fastest trains that will connect all three and you can get to any one of the three within 20 to 30 minutes. It's going to be a religious and economic financial world center for the world's largest false religious system that has duped the nations, particularly the nations of the Middle East, but all throughout the world and one of the world's leading economic, and they have the muscle and the money behind it to construct it. Yes? Who controls the Suez? Uh, Egypt controls the Suez, but it's internationally watched over very carefully. Yeah. Okay, so now briefly, I just want to get into some Old Testament passages. I'm going to go as quick as, as we uh, possibly can. The timing of her destruction. Um, and folks, reread. Revelation 17 and 18, knowing the things that you know now based on what Arabia is doing, and this is the tip of the iceberg, the excesses, the spending, the, the vile nature of what they're doing. 19 million, Saudi Arabia has 19 million citizens. They have 9 million expats from other countries that live in the country that service them. 9 million of 19 million citizens, they have 9 million people from other places. And many of them, when they come to work, they are from poor countries. They have no rights when they come. If you're a woman, you have zero rights, practically. They have to hand in their passports to the person who hires them under contract, and the person who hires them holds the passport. In many instances, these people become slaves. They are trapped. They, they cannot leave in many instances. And this is how Saudi Arabia is funding its excesses with cheap labor coming in from other places. These people essentially, and the sex slave industry is horrific of what's going on there. The excesses, the payoffs, 
Saudi Arabia through the years has paid off and bribed and bought its way all across the world. They have given tens of millions to Harvard to set up an Islamic studies program, Georgetown to set up an Islamic studies program, Cambridge, uh, and other universities. I'm not getting political in terms of which party you vote for. I'll just tell you that uh, there have been many books written and some very well documented that Bill and Hillary Clinton took probably a hundred million dollars from Arabia and the surrounding uh, Gulf countries for various reasons. Uh, I will tell you that Jimmy Carter, um, I believe, took an excess of a hundred hundred million for his study center and it's incredibly well endowed for his presidential library. And tragically, I will tell you that the information that I have read says that the Bushes have taken over a billion uh, from them. Saudi Arabia has been the biggest sponsor of Islam worldwide of any country in the world. They are the fountainhead of this false religious system and they are spreading it with hundreds of millions of dollars around the world this false religious system. Now, the timing, the timing of her destruction, I'll, I'm gonna to try to wrap up here quickly. Just briefly, remember we're that final seven year period of human history, that's what we're talking about, Daniel's 70th week. I told you that I do not believe that the scriptures teach that that entire seven years is all God's wrath, that God's wrath starts sometime inside of that seven year time period. So I would say the timing of her destruction based on the biblical text is after the rapture, I believe the rapture will take place sometime in that seven years, during the day of the Lord when God's wrath is poured out on the earth. The day of the Lord is the time of God's wrath. When you go back to the Old Testament and you look at all of the texts um, that you can see about the wrath of God and the judgment of God on the wicked nations, and there are multitudes of texts uh, in the Old Testament about that subject matter. The day of the Lord is the term that is used to talk about the time of God's wrath. Prophetic day of the Lord indicators. How do we know that the wrath of God is about to commence? <laughs> Cosmic disturbance, silence in heaven. Those are all things that indicate the time of God's wrath is about to occur. The sun will be darkened. The moon will not give her light. The stars shall fall from heaven. The powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the coming of the Son of Man. And then shall the tribes of the earth mourn because they know they're about to be judged. Cosmic disturbance is the indicator and silence in heaven. And there are a couple places in the scriptures, including Revelation, that, the, that tell us that the day of the Lord, the time of God's wrath is about to begin. And it's that time period that mystery, Babylon, the great mother of harlots, will be judged by the Lord. But there is a special judgment reserved for mystery, Babylon, the great mother of harlots, because she is the one who, who the kings of the earth have committed fornication with. She is the one that has duped the nation. She is the one that has is, that is permeated and, and perpetrated this hoax on humanity, this cultic religious system that has pulled people away from the one true God to a false religious system. <coughs> Isaiah 21 prophecy in the geography of Arabia. I won't go there now except to say to you um, that it is referred to in Isaiah 21 as the desert of the sea. When it's talking about the destruction of Arabia, the desert of the sea. Also, the terms in this, this uh, oracle or burden or warning against this cataclysmic destruction of end times Babylon, um, they refer to Duma and Arabia and Kedar, it says all the glory of Kedar will fall. That's a reference to Arabian tribes that live there. Clearly in these passages in Isaiah 21, uh, 21, 1, 11, 13, and 16, you can look them up. These are all references to destruction of a last day's Babylon. Let me just go back for one second. Look at Isaiah chapter 13 if you would. This is a crucial passage, Isaiah chapter 13. I think that this will help to put it into perspective for you. Isaiah 13, 1, very first verse. The burden of Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos did see. Lift ye up a banner upon the high mountain, exalt the voice unto them, shake the hand that they may go into the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for mine anger, even them that rejoice in my highness. Listen to this. The noise of a multitude 
in the mountains, like as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts mustereth the host of the battle. They come from a far country, from the end of heaven, even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. This is an oracle, remember, against Babylon. Very first verse of the chapter. Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. These are passages that parallel descriptions in the book of Revelation when the day of the Lord is about to commence. <coughs> and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Listen. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. This is his wrath. Cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. This is an oracle against Babylon, the last days Babylon. You know it's the last days because the passage is describing the day of the Lord. It's describing the cosmic disturbance that's coming. So you know the context is the last days destruction of Babylon. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. This is directly in parallel to the book of Revelation and the description of the cosmic disturbance that will signify the coming of the day of the Lord. The sun shall be darkened and it's going forth. The moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. It goes on, verse 17, very important. Behold, I will stir up the Medes. Who are the Medes of today? Kurds. The Kurds. The Kurds of today are the Medes. I will stir up the Medes against them, which shall not regard silver. And as for gold, they shall not delight in it. They don't care about the riches of Arabia. Their ideology is driving them to destroy Arabia and Mecca. Why? They're, they're all Muslim. Because it goes on to say, let me just finish. 19, and Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. <coughs> Verse 20, it shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation, neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. Can an Arabian pitch his tent in New York City? <laughs> or in Rome? That's the point I was telling you. If you're just reading Revelation 17 and 18, and you look at the economics of it, you say, mm, this could be New York. But there is a religious component. Remember, she's drunk on the blood of the saints, of the Jews and of believers. This is a religion throughout the last 1400 years that has slaughtered countless Jews and Christians throughout world history. This is the religion of Islam, not a religion of peace. So I just wanted to leave that with you. Isaiah chapter 13, I think a critical passage. Isaiah 21 is another one. And in Isaiah 21, the pronouncement is made exactly as it's made in Revelation 17 and 18. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Also in Jeremiah 49, listen to this. The earth is moved at the noise of their fall, and the cry of the noise is heard in the Red Sea in the Red Sea. And the description in Revelation 17 and 18, the merchants of the sea were wailing as they stood afar off for fear of being pulled into her torment as, she see, as they see her burning forever. In an ultimate sense, and this is the last slide, in an ultimate sense, what, what we are looking at is a tale of two cities and two women. There is a contrast that is being made between a wicked prostitute, which is the harlot, Mystery Babylon, mother of harlots, the greatest perpetrator of a false religious system that the world has ever known. And this, the fountainhead of that false religious and economic system is in Mecca, Saudi Arabia. It is a counterfeit of everything that Satan knows that God will do ultimately in Jerusalem. 
And the contrast is between a wicked prostitute who sits in the desert. Remember, John is called to the, into the desert to see this great vision? That's not incidental. He's called into the desert because Mecca sits in a desert. And the contrast is between a wicked prostitute and a pure bride. Look with me, if you will, at Revelation 21, and then we will close. Revelation 21, 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Let's skip over to verse 9. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away into the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. This is a contrast between the city of Satan and his counterfeit system, trying to usurp what rightfully belongs to the one true God, Yahweh, and the description of God and his final kingdom that will reign for a thousand years, the new Jerusalem that will descend from heaven over the city of Jerusalem as we know it today, completely changed, completely transfigured, a new heaven and a new earth with those of us who have trusted in Jesus Christ, worshiping him at his feet for a thousand years. Thank you so much for your time, and I hope that uh, that was helpful for you tonight.